<laughs> chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about it. Talk about them uh, when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on door frames of your houses and on your gates. May this reading fulfill your heart. All right. Good morning. You guys ready? I don't know. I don't know. I've, uh, I've preached here probably ha half a dozen times or so, and I still still get butterflies in my stomach. But um, what with it being uh, 4th of July this past week, I, I thought I might preach about, um, about nationalism and, and the kingdom of God and, and all that. But since I kind of want to keep my job a little bit longer, <laughs> and uh, I, since I think that th this subject is going to be a little bit more useful to us, um, I'm going to preach on, on being relevant, and that's why I've entitled this sermon, Are You Relevant? And uh, come to find out there's a book called Are You Relevant, which I haven't read, and now I feel like maybe I should have. Um, but that's what we're, t we're talking about, is just kind of asking the question, are you relevant? Am, am I relevant? Are we, as, as First United Methodist Church, are we being relevant? Um, and to, to sort of help illustrate the, the idea that I want to communicate today, um, we're going to talk about what is probably considered, generally considered, the most relevant min ministry in the church. And that would be youth ministry. So, <laughs> go figure. <laughs> but um, before we do that, uh, pray with me real quick. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I pray that you would... Um, Speak through me. Uh, open uh, our hearts here. Open our minds to receive what it is you want to communicate to us. Um, help us to set aside um, our pride. Help us to set aside um, our, our tiredness from the week. Help us to set aside anything that might hinder us accepting your word and, and the call that you've placed on our lives. We love you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, I don't know if you guys know much about youth ministry. Um, I had to go to school to study a lot about it. Um, and I, I guess I grew up in a youth group, and it never occurred to me to ask, where did we get youth ministry from? Um, because, come to find out, the book of Acts never talks about the first church's youth ministry program. Um, so I had to, to do a little digging. Uh, and so I'm going to give you guys a kind of a, a brief history of youth ministry. And, and maybe that will help us sort of flesh out what it, this idea of relevancy. Um, throughout most of human history, uh, the family, the, the parents, have been the, uh, the primary spiritual mentors uh, of children and young people. That's kind of why... Um, what that verse or those, uh, that passage in Deuteronomy was talking about is this is God giving his command to the people of Israel and then he tells the parents, now you guys teach this to the children. This, you, you live it out. Make it so much a part of your life that it's just kind of the water that they swim in. They almost don't even notice it as they grow up. And so um, you know, things like talk about it when you sit down to a meal, talk about it when you're walking along the road or riding in the car, talk about it, uh, put, you know, post it in your house places, um, keep this so much a part of your family's culture that your kids just sort of grow into it. 
And, and throughout most of history, it's been the parents who, who have been the primary spiritual mentors. Now, uh, churches and temples and synagogues have, have played a role in mentoring uh, young people, but the primary mentor was the parents. Well, as time goes on, uh, that sort of changed, and where, where we find the earliest foundations of youth ministry popping up was during the 1800s, in this, this about 50-year period between 1824 and 1875. Um, at the time, there were a lot of child labor laws sort of coming into play, and so there were fewer and fewer children working in factories, and more and more children kind of just running the streets. And so churches felt like, well, we need to get kids off the streets. Let's get them out of the streets and into an environment where they can get some education. And um, so that's where things like s Sunday school programs came up and uh, organizations like the YMCA and the YWCA. And this was mostly uh, focused on children because at the time, uh, teenagers still entered the workforce pretty young. Um, but this, this was kind of the beginning of what would become youth ministry. Um, in was it, 1875, public high schools started to come into play, and that's when uh, churches kind of followed suit. By it, it, public high schools brought teenagers now out of the workplace and, and started putting them into educational environments. And so the church was like, "Well, we should do the same thing," and so started having things uh, for for teenagers. Um, between 1881 and 1925, these various organizations started to pop up in Christianity, um, mostly along denominational lines. They stayed pretty, pretty strongly affiliated with their various denominations, but they would pop up and, and they, would, they were focused on teenagers. The idea was to sort of shelter teenagers from, from the world. Um, to, to, as um, a lot of people were moving from rural areas into, into larger cities, um, young people were facing a lot of temptations and a lot of um, just the world being thrown at them. And so churches sought to sort of shelter teenagers from all of that. However, in 1925, um, what came the Scopes Monkey Trial, which, in case you don't know what that is, it was um, a court case to decide whether or not uh, schools should teach evolution. And with that, um, when evolution was start being taught in schools, it started raising a lot of questions. Um, now, whether, whichever side of that debate you sort of land on, the point is it had a profound impact on the way churches engaged teenagers because now there came a bit of skepticism towards, um, towards faith organizations in the part of teenagers because they'd say, well, you're teaching me this, but when I go to school five days a week, I hear this. So um, it started to create a challenge. In the 1930s and 40s, churches began to take more control over their, over their youth programs, and it, it wasn't just an independent sort of thing. Um, in 1937, the first full-time youth minister was hired at a Baptist church in St. Louis, and organizations like Youth for Christ and Young Life began to host uh, these outreach, these um, evangelism rallies in, in local high schools. In the 1950s and 60s, Youth for Christ changed their focus from big evangelism events to uh, smaller Bible studies. Most large churches by the 1950s and 60s began to have youth directors. And uh, in 1954, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, um, an organization a ministry on campus at high schools um, began. In the early 1970s, churches began hiring former uh, Youth for Christ and Young Life leaders to be their youth pastor. Um, and, so, and so by the 1970s, most of the medium-sized churches, medium to large-sized churches, have youth directors or youth pastors um, to, to focus specifically on teenagers. And then things started to get kind of weird. Um, in the 1970s, youth ministry became much more, uh, much more high energy, much, much more attractional. Um, the, we found out that we could, if you offer burgers or, or pizza and some games, we could start to attract pretty large crowds. And, 
And so, so the, the task became come up with new things to, to draw kids in. And it became more and more until you're doing wilder and wackier games and you're doing more extreme things. And at one point, towards the, the late 70s, early 90s, I don't, I don't know how this happened, it became a thing to, to sort of say, hey, if you can get you know, this many students to show up to this event or to youth group next week, um, the youth leader will swallow a live goldfish. And I don't know how, who, who said, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> but um, it started happening. And then um, in the 1980s, a lot of the, a lot of the entertainment venues and, and uh, media sources began to really pick up. Um, things like MTV and Nickelodeon really started to have a presence in the life of young people. And th this put a lot of pressure on youth programs to be even more exciting, even more entertaining. And now we have, we have pizza parties and, and we have live music and we have, you know, like worship rock bands and we have uh, big video productions and we have lights and sounds and we have the craziest, most wildest games that you can imagine. And all these things to try, and, to try and draw as many students in as we could because now it wasn't just us competing against um, the, the, the dangers of society. Now we were competing against the entertainment sources of society. And this, this went on for, for a couple decades and, and then, then at about the turn of the century, the beginning of the 21st century, youth pastors began to realize that teenagers were not as interested in youth group. We, we began to, to notice that, that we were losing them. And, and maybe we were losing them during the high school years um, because we couldn't compete with, with uh, MTV and VH1 and Nickelodeon and Disney and the radio and Facebook and MySpace and Twitter and Vine and Instagram. But we also realized that we couldn't compete after high school, that after high school we were losing a lot of students. In fact, um, the general statistic, um, a lot of times you hear like 90%, it's not 90%, but it's still the majority, 60 to 70% of high school graduates who attend church regularly will stop after high school. Um, and usually there's this 15 to 20 year period where they just don't go to church anymore and then when they start settling down they have kids of their own after a while maybe they'll bring they'll start coming back to church but during this period after high school we just kind of lose them and youth pastors and youth ministers began to realize we weren't being effective um, we we were not having a long-lasting impact on students uh, Dave Wright He's a youth ministry coordinator for the Episcopal Diocese in, in South Carolina. He's kind of been in the youth ministry game for a while. Uh, he writes, We created a consumer mentality amongst a generation that did not expect to be challenged at church in ways similar to what they face at school and on sports teams. In the midst of all this, church leaders and parents came to expect that successful youth ministry is primarily about having fun and attracting large crowds. You see, we'd become cultural, and somehow in the mix of, of becoming cultural, we stopped being relevant. As, as more and more studies came out, as, as more and more research and statistics started to show, we as youth pastors began to realize that not only is that entertainment, attractional model of youth ministry ineffective over the long haul, it's actually damaging. To, to the faith of young people because it creates the, this link in their mind between faith and fun. And when you have faith and fun together, then, then you're, you're solid, you're golden. But as soon as fun is gone, so is their faith. And, and I've seen it, I've seen it firsthand when, when young people stop finding fun in the things of God, when... Um, when the church just can't compete with the media moguls, um, they bail. They, they, they decide, well, it's not, it's not fun, so it's not for me. Um, I, had a, a, I have a friend 
who uh, was in the youth ministry game for a while, and he gave me this one bit of wisdom one time. He said, what you win them with is what you've won them to. Meaning that if you win them with, with pizza and games and fun and, and entertainment, then that's what you have won them to. You haven't won them to Christ or to relationships or to the church. You've won them to the things you won them with. John Acuff, uh, he's a Christian author, and uh, he used to be an advertising writer. He talks about this ad he saw in a paper one time. Um, this church put an ad in the paper saying, if you come to church on, on this day, you can enter a, a drawing to win a free car. And the idea was to get, get people to come to church. And he, he got on the church's website, and they were, they were giving away more than just a free car. They were giving away, like, I don't know, all-you-can-eat buffets and stuff like that. Um, and the idea was to get people in church. But he talked about how, how that's not a good way to get people in church. He says, study after study has shown that we are creatures of habit. We repeat ourselves. So if you attract a big crowd with a car giveaway or a hot new worship band or anything else, you create a, a relationship built on reward, not a redeemer. And when you try to take away that reward, you'll lose a lot of your guests. Um, Mark Upton, he's a pastor and, and a former youth worker. He once told this up-and-coming youth pastor, he said, if anyone asks you about your youth ministry, tell them you'll let them know in 10 years. Because truthfully, that's when it matters. I, I, it, as a youth minister, it's tempting to, to look at at our youth groups now and say this is how effective we are but whether or not we can draw a large crowd whether or not we can get kids to smile and recite bible verses now now makes little difference if they, if we have not built into them a christ-like character that's going to be with them a decade from now and and that's difficult that's that's tough for youth leaders because we've almost created for ourselves a culture where we throw seed on shallow soil and then sort of give ourselves a hand because it grew a little. But we're not around long enough to see it, it die off because it has no roots. And so that's, that's the thing about the gospel. And that, that's kind of why I wanted to talk about youth ministry and talk about this idea of being relevant. Because we had become cultural. We had become attractional. We had become entertaining. We'd become very enticing, but we stopped being relevant. Because relevant is not about being cultural. Relevant is about, are we answering the questions that they're asking? Are we meeting the needs that they have? If they have needs that we aren't meeting, it doesn't matter how awesome our games are or how flashy our video productions are, we're not being relevant. If we are giving them tons and tons of answers to questions they aren't asking, then we, it doesn't matter how great our answers are, we're irrelevant. And, and that's something that, that is true not just for youth ministry, but it's true for churches in general. It's true for our church here at First United Methodist. As, as we talk with, um, with other United Methodist churches, uh, we're in a discussion with them about how can we partner together? How can, how can we pool maybe resources and time? How can we come alongside each other to find ways to better affect the kingdom, to, to better live out the kingdom of God in the Clinton area? And so one thing that I really want us to bear in mind as we enter into this discussion and as we, we follow through with it is, are we being relevant? Because being relevant can mean being cultural, um, sometimes we get so caught up in, in holding on to our traditions and, and how we've always done things and what's comfortable and what we're used to that we fail to, to keep up and we fail to be relevant to the next up-and-coming generation. But we can also run the risk of trying to be so cultural, so cool and new and innovative, of trying so hard to keep up with the Joneses that we, are no, we, we sort of lose our soul and we're no longer being relevant. We're no longer meeting people's needs we're no longer answering the questions that they are asking. And so that's, that's my challenge for us today. Um, take it from, from a youth pastor and, and from the youth ministry program who have had to learn the hard way that being cool is not being relevant always, all the time. 
Sometimes being relevant means being cultural, but sometimes being relevant means being countercultural. And, we, and we ha- it takes discernment, and it takes dis- um, maturity, and we have, to, we have to learn to wade through those waters together. So that's my thought for you today. Uh, take this, don't, don't just hear this, but take this, go home with it, wrestle with it, and, and really evaluate, um, evaluate our church. I, I invite you to, to think about our church as a whole. Think about churches in the Clinton area. Think about, um, about maybe the areas of the church that you're involved in. And, and think about your own personal life and, and your interactions with other people. And be, be willing to seriously consider this question. Are you relevant? Am I relevant? Are we, church, are we relevant? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are good, and you are loving, and you are kind. And God, you are always relevant. You're not behind us trying to catch up, and you're not often caught up in the culture, disconnected from people's needs. But you are always relevant. You are always seeking to love those who are hurting and lost. You are always seeking to, to give answer and comfort to those who, who are confused and without direction. And Father, I pray that we would partner with you, that we would come alongside you, and we too would be relevant. And whether, whatever that looks like, whether it means being cultural and, 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 and speaking the language of the culture, whether it means being countercultural and looking weird and out of place in the way that our world does things, Father, help us to to have the wisdom and discernment that it takes to know where we land and help us to always strive to be relevant. We love you, and we can't do this without you, and thank you for saying that we'd never have to. And all this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.